to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Tesofensine is a triple monoamine reuptake inhibitor, and clearly it's what we're going to focus on today. We'll start by talking about what it is, what the research has shown, and the path it's taken in the clinical marketplace. It's my hope that this will be the most comprehensive evidence-based video on tesofensine on YouTube, or at least in the top 1,000. I'll shoot for the stars. Let's start off by discussing what the monoamine transmitters are. So they're dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. And these compounds are of interest in the fields of neuropsychiatry as they're closely tied to emotions, behaviors, and mood. And although all their particular roles are popularly debated, we know that in different disease states, increasing or decreasing their presence does serve many a benefit depending on what cognitive or mental health processes they're dealing with. And as such, there are plenty of popular medications out there that manipulate presence of these monoamine neurotransmitters, most oftentimes inhibiting their reuptake, thereby prolonging their presence in the synaptic cleft. For instance, SSRIs, oftentimes utilized for depression and anxiety, selectively inhibit the reuptake of serotonin. Other medications like NDRIs, which can be prescribed for depression and smoking cessation, focus on decreasing reuptake of norepinephrine and dopamine. Then there are selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors used primarily for ADHD. Tesofensine, which is also known as NS2330, is a triple monoamine reuptake inhibitor inhibitor, which we can assume based off what we've already discussed, is that all three monoamine neurotransmitters are involved, so it would prevent reuptake of serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, and prolong their presence and utilization by the brain. But what's interesting about this compound, which varies a bit by comparison to its other monoamine reuptake inhibitor friends, is its proposed ability to more directly and more beneficially affect appetite and weight. And unlike some of the other compounds we discuss, where we really have to focus on preclinical data involving rodents and other animals, we can in a way surpass some of that drier material because there do exist clinical evaluations in humans, thank goodness. But before we do that and jump ahead, if you are still watching and are not yet asleep, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. It's the best way to help out a small, mostly peptide YouTuber out there. Thank you in advance. So the interest in tesofensine for management of obesity lies in the pertinent yet unclear relationship between neurotransmission and appetite. For instance, while some SSRIs are tied to weight gain, it can be said that other compounds that prolong exposure to dopamine or epinephrine or both may be more weight neutral or anti-obesity. Understanding the role of neurotransmitters in appetite regulation is complex, much like deciphering the cause of a massive traffic jam on a highway where a thousand lanes merge. We'll say that each lane represents one of the many psychological or biochemical functions these neurotransmitters are involved in in just as factors like accidents, construction, and rush hour can contribute to congestion, numerous processes influence appetite and weight regulation, underscoring how little we truly know about the intricacies of neurotransmission. However, as you'll see, the focus of tesofensine wasn't always in appetite regulation, interestingly enough. Advins was the name of a series of clinical studies that evaluated the compound's use in chronic neurocognitive disorders, particularly Parkinson's disease, which is linked with a diminished presence of dopamine in certain parts of the brain, thereby inflicting disorders of movement. And on top of that, there are localized areas of decreased serotonin, which is in part responsible for popularly developed depressive symptoms and even at times hallucinations in conjunction with the dopaminergic dysregulation that's present. And so early on in its clinical evaluation, tesofensine was studied in patients with Parkinson's disease for over 14 weeks, particularly in those treated with levodopa, a dopamine precursor who experienced recurrent worsening of motor symptoms as the drug wore off. However, research in that regard was ultimately disbanded after this trial as there didn't appear to be any dose-response relationship. Improvements, if they were seen, were modest at best, and the presence of adverse gastrointestinal and neuropsychiatric side effects in a population of people already extremely susceptible to the latter really just made it not worth it. 
What did come out of the study was a better understanding of pharmacokinetics, which paints the drug as possessing a pretty long half-life of about 8 to 9 days. And I feel like this is an appropriate place to add that the most recent of data highlights lower dopaminergic activity and a stronger effect on norepinephrine, which highlights that even though this is a triple monoamine reuptake inhibitor, the affinity for certain receptors certainly varies. So in a similar vein, when we're talking about neurocognitive disorders, tesofensine was also evaluated in patients with Alzheimer's disease, mostly with regards to basic evaluations of tesofensine and its active metabolite, which is called M1, which has a half-life about double its progenitor. Some of the findings included a large volume of distribution that seemed to be influenced by body weight, reduced clearance in women when compared to men, and the results to the early trials on Alzheimer's are not publicly available, but I will read a segment of a piece that came out of the AAPS journal or the American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists, and I quote, first clinical results of two small four-week phase 2A trials performed in mild Alzheimer's dementia patients were promising. A significant improvement in cognitive function was demonstrated. Subsequently, a 14-week phase 2B proof-of-concept POC trial was performed in 430 patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, the trial did not meet the efficacy criteria to proceed with the phase 3 development program. So, from what I was able to collect, it appears that the fate of the drug in the context of Alzheimer's was similar to that of Parkinson's, which is unfortunate because they're very sad and life-altering disease states, but after only modest results were seen, this is when it fell out of favor when talking about those conditions, and came more into the limelight as an anti-obesity compound. Because one thing stood out when the data on the patients with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's dementia were reviewed, and that is the side effect of weight loss. Tisofensine's development was predominantly undertaken by a Danish company called NeuroSearch, hence the NS and NS2330, in collab with Boringer Ingelheim, which is a company based out of Germany. And although Boringer Ingelheim today is still developing drugs within the class of the GLP-1s to aid in weight loss, we're forced to ask, what in the heck happened to tisofensine? Well, after the trials in Parkinson's, Boringer Ingelheim eventually dropped their rights to the compound, so that essentially left the Danish market to undertake further research, some of which has gained some traction. So in 2014, NeuroSearch transferred its remaining rights to Tesofensine to another company based out of Denmark called Sinona. The sale was part of a series of transactions where NeuroSearch divested various preclinical and clinical assets to Sinona between 2012 and 2016. Now, Sinona's pipeline consists of two compounds derived from tesofensine. First is one called tesamet, which is tesofensine combined with metoprolol, a beta blocker and antihypertensive. And it's used for obesity due to hypothalamic brain damage or in a chromosomal deletion syndrome called Prader-Willi. Research is currently paused due to funding. Then, Sinona is also continuing to develop tesofensine for the primary purpose of management of obesity, which has been evaluated in a series of trials called TIPO or TYPO for Therapeutic Intervention for the Prevention of Obesity. And at this point, about 15 years later, then the TYPO 1 trial, tesofensine for weight loss as developed by Sonona is apparently nearing regulation in Mexico via partnership with a company called Medics. And so this whole picture really just shows how long it takes for a drug to get approved, especially one with less financial investment and one that's less popular. But overall, based off the literature, there does appear to be a relationship between use of tesofensine, increased satiety, and weight loss in the populations tested. Some possible side effects include gastrointestinal upset, increases in heart rate, and elevated blood pressure, which makes sense since serotonin-enhancing drugs oftentimes come with gi related related side effects, as serotonin itself is highly modulatory of gastrointestinal function. Moreover, increasing presence of norepinephrine, replicating to an extent that sympathetic fight-or-flight response, would subsequently lead to increased heart rate and blood pressure readings, which of course isn't something to be taken lightly. A lot of the theory about why tesofensine works for weight loss is in some way or another related to neurotransmitter function, particularly with regards to decreased reuptake of dopamine and 
norepinephrine. But to be honest, we don't completely know. The idea is that it's more causal of appetite suppression via neurotransmitter modulation within the hypothalamus, but this neurological structure is likely not the only one involved. Remember that traffic jam analogy from earlier. And the thing is, I wonder what the rebound effect would be like. I imagine that similar to psychiatric medications who categorically overlap with this compound, it's not unlikely that there would be some sort of syndrome or set of withdrawal symptoms that come with stopping the product. And after stopping, will the appetite suppression reverse to baseline as some of the earlier data suggests? Things to keep in mind. And also, I wonder where the public appeal sits with regards to tisofensine currently, since the GLP-1 agonists have really taken the world by storm. I'm aware there is certainly an adverse effect profile associated with the likes of semaglutide, which oftentimes does revolve around gastrointestinal upset too, but I imagine it has less of a palpable psychoactive effect, like impact impact on mood and sleep than would tisofensin given these direct neurotransmission modulation. And I would add that if somebody is taking this and already is on a psychiatric medication that alters neurotransmission like most of them, there could be enhancement of certain side effects, mitigated progress, or even deleterious outcomes that one would not have really even considered previously. So this is me just thinking aloud here, but things I would personally keep in mind and things really not worth overlooking. Regardless, I think this is probably a good place to stop for the initial video on tisofensine at least. So if there's more you want to hear about, leave a comment below and I'll either address what I've found there in the comments or make another video talking about particular questions that you have. I'll leave all the sources utilized here to make this video in the description below of which there are probably going to be like over 20. And as always, if you're looking for a way to further support the channel, you will find the link to my Patreon in the description below. Most importantly, thank you for watching, taking the time. I really appreciate it and I hope that you have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.